Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Judy Marquez Kiyama, Associate Vice Provost for Faculty Development here at the University of Arizona. And I'm excited to welcome you on behalf of Faculty Affairs and HSI initiatives. Thank you for joining us today for the continuation of our HSI Serving This webinar series, Centering Serviness. And I'm not sure Monique and I were talking about beforehand how time flew so quickly this year, but we find ourselves at the last session of the year. Um, truly, these webinars have been a monthly highlight for me, and I'm honored that I've been able to virtually sit beside my colleagues and learn so much, um, and I know that today will be no exception. We begin by recognizing and paying honor to the original inhabitants of the land on which the University of Arizona resides. This region includes the ancestral homelands of the Tohono O'odham and the Pascoyaki tribes, and we offer our gratitude in being able to share knowledge on these indigenous lands. We understand this notion of servingness by drawing upon Dr. Gina Garcia's extensive body of work and feature faculty and staff who engage in scholarship and servingness efforts that honor the cultures and the lived experiences of Latinx, Black, Indigenous, and underrepresented students and communities. And as I've shared before, the goals of our series are threefold. By spotlighting current scholarship, we offer examples of the rich ways in which servingness is enacted across faculty and staff across the institution by faculty and staff. And we invite others both on, both on campus and nationally to learn about and engage in these efforts. And we build knowledge. Each month we address the question, what next steps are needed to build institutional capacity around HSI servingness? The U of A received its HSI designation in April of 2018 and has been recognized by both Excelencia in Education and the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities for Leadership and commitment to Latinx and Hispanic student success. So I'm joined today with this final panel, this incredible final panel featuring faculty within Mexican American studies. I won't go deep into the description of MAS, Mexican American studies, as I know our first speaker will do a little bit of history. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Ada Wilkinson Lee. She's the acting department head and associate professor her research, teaching, and service are centered on addressing Latino health from a community-based participatory action research perspective. Current and future endeavors consist of continuation of addressing Latino health disparities from a social, social psychological perspective, utilizing mixed methods and innovative met methodology, including digital story analysis. She has published widely on Latino parent adolescent communication, adolescent emotional distress, provider cultural sensitivity, and how to conduct translational studies to improve access to healthcare services among underserved reproductive age women through dissemination of health information and resources via promotoras. Dr. Damian Baca is an associate professor. He's the author of Mestiza and Mestizo Scripts, Digital Migrations, and the Territories of Writing, a retelling of the story of writing as a technology that emerges not with alphabets, in the North Atlantic, but across the Valley of Mexico, long before European territorial annexation and the advent of modernity colonial, and coloniality. His recent publication, Rhetorics Elsewhere and Otherwise, is a winner of the 2020 Convention on College Composition and Communication, CCCC, Outstanding Book Award. Dr. Michelle Teyes is an assistant professor, an interdisciplinary scholar trained in community studies, sociology, Chicano Chicano Studies and Education. She has, she has been committed to mapping projects of resistance, exploring, I lost my place, um, exploring shared human experiences and advancing social justice for the last 25 years. Having been raised along the US-Mexico border divide, both her scholarly and community engaged work has, deeply, has been deeply shaped by this experience. She writes about transnational community formations and disruptions, Chicana Mothering, and Gendered Migration in several book anthologies. She is a founding member, member of the Chicana Motherwork Collective and Binational Artist in Residency Project. Her co-edited book, The Chicana Motherwork Anthology, is one of my favorites. Dr. Maurice Rafael Magaña is an assistant professor, a sociocultural anthropologist who re whose research focuses on the cultural politics of youth organizing, transnational migration, urban space and social movements in Mexico and the United States. Specifically, his work examines how youth construct themselves as political actors 
in relation to multiple communities across time and space. His research aims to provide a transnational perspective on historic marginalization, racialization, youth political culture, and the role of art in activism. His first book, titled Cartographies of Youth Resistance, Hip Hop, Punk, and Urban Autonomy in Mexico was just released in early 2020. So you can see we have an incredible panel with us. Um, I probably could have gone on and on the whole hour just about uh, all of their accolades and accomplishments, but we'll turn over the panel to the four of you. Um, each person is prepared to speak for about eight to 10 minutes, eight to nine minutes, we'll time you. Um, and then we'll leave some time, of course, at the end for questions, pop your questions into the Q&A box or the chat and Monique and I uh, will invite you to unmute so you can ask your questions towards the end. So turning it over to you, Ada. So thank you, um, Dr. Guillermo, for allowing us to be here today to share on our uh, research and to talk a little bit about our department as well. We are very honored to be here. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I also had a land uh, acknowledgement statement. Uh, Dr. Guillermo, um, you know, already uh, shared one with you, so I won't go into it, but I do think it's very important for us as scholars to always recognize that we are on borrowed land and to recognize um, that whenever we present um, our information and our research to people. I wanted to provide also a historical context about the Department of Mexican American Studies. It's important and to know and acknowledge that our department is forged by a political movement and very much so a, a movement led by student activists. And so when we talk about our department, it was the community that recognized the need for higher education to include a department like Mexican American studies, because oftentimes the, our communities, the Latinx communities voice had been silenced. And so they felt this need and there were some committed individuals, um, many community individuals in the community that felt that we needed to push forward and have a department that recognized um, the experiences of the Latinx community. And so um, it first began as the uh, Mexican American um, Research Center, and then eventually became the Department of Mexican American Studies. So really the community voices are at the center of what we do. And as you'll see, as we move forward talking about our research, um, it's our mission as uh, Latinx uh, scholars and faculty to really move forward the voices of our community. So in order to do that, and I always like to begin by acknowledging my background because my background and my lived experience really does, uh, did mold where I am today as a research scholar. And I am, um, I was born in Douglas, Arizona. My parents and my brother still live there. Um, and more specifically, I'm from Purtoville, Arizona, if everyone knows uh, that area. Uh, but usually I say Douglas because very few people know where Purtoville is. It's a very small town right next to Douglas. And so my background is very much um, growing up on the border, going back and forth from Douglas to Agua Prieta. And so that allowed me to have a wide perspective of the Latinx community on both sides of the border and to recognize um, some of the challenges that oftentimes were faced by my community uh, with regards to resources or lack of resources to access to healthcare. But it also provided me with the understanding that my community is resilient and it provided me uh, you know, to see these strategies that my community used to get um, through some of those challenging times. And so that's what led me to really focus on uh, Latinx health disparities and access to healthcare. And as Dr. Guillama um, noted, um, I do so from a community-based participatory research framework. And the reason behind this is because we as scholars recognize that there are a lot of structural barriers um, that underserved, under-resourced communities have which oftentimes may limit access and the, the ability to effectively participate with their health decisions. This is not to say that they're not, that health isn't important, but there are, are these social determinants of health that oftentimes uh, get in the way because we have low um, resources or lower chances of um, economic opportunity or educational opportunities. So while using a community-based support, um, it really does help increase the community level capacity, right? For us to acknowledge 
where are those structural issues that are impeding access and optimal health, and really um, utilizing that information to obtain greater health, education, and interventions. And those are the things that are going to help us narrow uh, the most pressing um, health disparity issues in the Latinx community, as has been highlighted with the COVID pandemic. It's actually brought it to the forefront, the need for us to do um, community systemic change. So that's why I engage um, in this re research project uh, process that's very much where the community is front and center. So rather than coming at it from a, a researcher dictating to the community what they need to be focusing on, we let the community guide us and, and tell us what are the needs the, and how can then we may move forward our research to not just be research for other researchers, but for the sake of changing policy at um, institutional systemic levels. Well, we can't do this work without our partners. And when I say partners, I truly mean that my partners in, in all of the research, all the active grants that I have are really from the community. So what, some of my uh, partners are promotoras or community health workers. And the reason they're so important and vital to our work is because they're experts in the field. They, are valuable, they have valuable sources of information. They're the go-to people. Like if you need something in the community, they're the ones that are gonna tell you how to get it and who to call and when to go there. And because they're members of the community, they're invested in the well-being of the community. And so these are the people that, that we need to highlight and, and they are active members of our research team. So they participate in everything from um, how we write the grant through how we collect data, through the data analysis and even data dissemination. And, and so that's the importance of making sure that you have a cadre of well-versed individuals who are also a part of the community that we're serving. This also leads to the importance of, of community action boards. So within all of my research, I always make sure to include community action boards within our research. Um, the reason for this is because it's, in, it's important to include a diverse um, community voices. And in order to have a more holistic and comprehensive approach towards a health issue, it's important to have everyone at the table. And if we're missing people at the table, this is where community action boards come in because they can tell you why isn't the food bank here? We need to be talking to them, right? So having that is really important along with shared ownership of the research. So as we move forward, it's not my research, it's not the research of the UOA team, but it's really guided by our guiding principles of who owns the research. And that's all of the people in our coalition, in our partnerships own the research. And they're the ones that decide how we're going to share that data, how we're going to um, uh, disseminate the information to the community. And lastly, what that does, it builds a network of accountability. So we can hold each other to task and we do that, and it, oftentimes that can be uncomfortable, but it's really important given the history of our Latino community and how we have been impacted oftentimes by researchers, it's important for us to hold ourselves accountable and self-reflect and, and have those kind of checks and balances in place so that we can conduct the best ethical approaches to our community um, needs and research. So with that, I'm going to leave it there. Um, thank you so much for having me uh, speak today. Here's my contact information. You can email me or you can contact me directly at my office number. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Damian Baca. Uh, thank you very much, Ada, for um, talking us through your uh, research, as well as offering a context for the Department of Mexican American Studies. And many thanks to Judy for her kind introduction uh, this afternoon. Uh, again, I'm Damian. Uh, I am originally from New Mexico. I'm the child of light-skinned uh, Mexican parents. My immediate family are living on the ancestral territory of the Sandia Pueblo peoples in and around Alameda, Corrales, and Albuquerque areas. Uh, my research, my, my practice, my advocacy is grounded in how Mexican-American communities use writing and literacy practices to endure, to create change, and flourish. Um, while the, the uh, 
conventional meaning of literacy is historically you know, tied to a, a functional ability to read and write letters. Uh, I'm, I'm building upon the work of others well before me to uh, pluralize literacy. I seek to enable um, deeper and more complex understandings of the shift or the movement from literacy as you know, singular and simplified and so-called neutral uh, notion to literacies plural as textured meaning making practices with symbolic tools and sign systems. So that's alphabetic script as well as non-alphabetic inscription practices, uh, diverse and living systems of communication that are situated in ever widening um, you know, historical, institutional, social and, and cultural contexts. Um, more specifically, I am drawn to how graphic symbols are enacted within colonial structures of power and how they metaphorically express, encode, and enact commentary about relations and relationships in the US-Mexico borderlands and how such practices might foster um, the co-creation of livable, sustainable futures without colonial exploitation. So on my, my first slide, we're, we're looking at uh, Quetzalcoatl. This is Quetzalcoatl or feathered serpent, uh, often considered a, a figurative progenitor of indigenous populations in central Mexico. Now, while these images that we see here, they'd be dated to around um, the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. I'll note that Quetzalcoatl it, uh, predates the 13th century and predates the, the Aztec empire. Uh, Quetzalcoatl could be um, dated as, as early as 400 uh, BCE. Uh, this is a um, one panel from a pictorial manuscript containing calendrical and religious and, ri and ritual content. And we're more specifically, we're seeing a, a, a dual uh, or twin manifestation of Quetzalcoatl. So there is, is a hecat, a hecat, which is um, wind and also um, spirit. A hecat is representative of the living world. And uh, it is through a hecat that the technology of writing uh, is um, handed to the people. And so one of the earliest expressions for writing in the Western hemisphere is actually Tlaquilolitzli. It's a bit of a tongue twister, but Tlaquilolitzli. Uh, translated in English is the spreading of color on hard surfaces. So, so it kind of escapes the idea of lettered or, or unlettered. Um, in, um, on the left-hand side, we have Miklan de Kutli. That's the figure in, in, in uh, bone white facing to the left. Um, Miklan de Kutli is symbolizing um, the, the underworld, that the moment of death, uh, the place where human remains go. We can see that both figures are, are connected at the spine and are surrounded by day signs. Um, so time itself is divided between Ehekat and Miklan de Kutli, representing the a, a totality of, of the life cycle and of, of death. So this, this is a pre-conquest manuscript. It was stolen by the Spanish cross and crown and handed to an Italian um, cardinal and theologian. At his passing in um, the very early 19th century, uh, the Vatican Library seized this copy and it remains there in the Vatican. I'll note that there is a full color facsimile, a copy of the Codex. It's now been, it's been renamed, of course, as part of the Borgia collection or the Codex Borgia. The Codex Borgia has a full color uh, uh, facsimile. Uh, we, the University of Arizona Special Collections Library has it. I'll also note that the Special Collections hosts an impressive digital archive of several pictorial manuscripts and also including some hard copies of, of, of facsimiles. It's quite impressive and a fantastic um, research and teaching tool. So it, uh, can we advance um, to the second slide, Fan? Okay. Or I know it's a bit small, but if you can look to the, to the left, you're seeing a, a, a yet another representation of Quetzalcoatl. The, the, the figure has actually um, been, been flipped. Uh, 
the positioning, in other words, of Ehekat and Miklan de Kutli are, are now at the opposite. We're looking at a document, the Codex Espangliensis from Columbus to the Border Patrol, published uh, through City Lights Press from Enrique Jagoya, Guillermo Gomez Pena, and Felicia Rice. This is available commercially. Um, it's quite easy to purchase. It's not that costly. I'll note that the Poetry Center uh, here does uh, include a non-circulating copy in their library. And the Science and Engineering Library also has a non-circulating copy available to students. So this document, the Codex Espangliensis, um, is folds out in an accordion file. So there is no central binding. It reaches out 22 feet. This is a collective work and it's addressing uh, political and social matters concerning uh, Mexican-American culture. It presents unique interpretations of the conquest and genocide in the aftermath of 1492 and the cultural transformations resulting from Western territorial expansion, as well as economic interdependencies that linger uh, throughout the present day. So when I compiled the slide, I didn't realize just uh, quite how small it will be. You can see in the center, there is some alphabetic script. And uh, I'll just read a, a brief portion of the, the script in, in the center. Um, the narrative is this. In 1492, an Aztec sailor, Nakli Europe Zin Tezpoca, departs from the port of Minatitlan with wooden rafts. Three months later, he discovers a new continent and names it Europe Zin after himself. In November 1512, the Aztecs begin the conquest of Europe Zin and the name of the Lord of cross-cultural misunderstanding. So here, of course, there's an obvious reversal of roles in history of, of um, Mesoamerica and, and, um, and Europe. So we're looking at the, the mixing of, of historical periods, um, cultural reference, the use of fragmentation and parody to support um, defiant and satirical readings of dominant colonial history, supporting reading, uh, readings of history and rereadings of history uh, forward and in reverse against the grain, and ways of, of knowing that, that might resist flows of symbolic information that would perpetuate canonized and hegemonic um, discourses about a colonial history, but, uh, and also the, the lingering effects of, of colonization and coloniality in our present moment. And so my goal, and I'm gonna close with this in the interest of time, in presenting this work with students, which I absolutely love because I'm learning uh, continuously. I continue to learn uh, more about this text the, the, the more often I teach it. But I have th three, three goals that I'm, I'm hoping to, to achieve by bringing this uh, to students. Uh, so I'm, first, I'm, I'm hoping to synthesize and build upon influential Mexican-American perspectives that would help illustrate and problematize um, creative expression and production under colonial relations of power. Uh, second, I hope to decenter the Western Roman alphabet as the unquestioned default for the study of written communication. Uh, so I'm kind of rem removing uh, not just the alphabet, but also in some ways, maybe removing English language dominance as well as the global North Atlantic from the center of textual interpretation. And finally, to, um, I hope to examine non-dominant approaches to literacies broadly defined and apply them to methods for analysis, for her hermeneutic reconstructions of subjugated theories of communication, intellectual inquiry, and social transformation. So with that, I believe we're transitioning now to uh, Michelle. Hello, good afternoon. It's quite an honor really to, to be here with you all and to learn from my colleagues. And with my colleagues, I feel very lucky to form part of the Department of Mexican American Studies. I've learned so much uh, from Watham territories in the last 15 years of living here. Um, thankful for that. I come from Kumeyaay territories um, and I call myself on the previous slide, said Chicana Transfronteriza. Uh, that's sort of how I embody my experience and my, my ways of moving in through the world um, because I did grow up along the US-Mexico border as uh, Julie kindly introduced me. Um, and that experience really shaped who I became as a scholar, as a mother, as a writer, as a thinker. 
Uh, and my training as an interdisciplinary scholar shapes how I do research, what I think about, what I'm compelled to do, and how I think about what we can offer from this space in the universe. Uh, my research examines the ways in which gender interacts with social movements, migration, and the US-Mexico border. Um, and it also contributes to the field of Chicana studies and the study of identity, intersectionality, and motherhood. I, um, growing up along the border, when I went into undergraduate school, I went to UCLA, and it was there that I took my first Chicana Chicana studies class. And it was the first time that I saw myself reflected in not only the curriculum, but in who was teaching the courses, um, and how I felt in that space. And I can honestly say that taking those classes um, changed the course of my life in as much as my own experiences and how I grew up, right? Um, and so with that history, you know, coming to my work and what I do, um, you know, I have these key terms, transfronteriza, autonomy in the space of neoliberal neglect, Chicana mother work, I talk about my methodologies as a Chicana feminist ethnographer. Uh, and I really do see my work as an offering, you know, something that I hope lands that some people might take up and that, um, and that we can build from, right? And thinking about knowledge production as a political practice and as social relations. Um, and so I wanna talk about my first project, the next slide. Thank you so much, Ada, for doing this for us. Um, and so uh, the Chicana Mother Work Project um, was really came out of me writing about my rage and frustrations of, of becoming a mother, a brown mother in a world that doesn't recognize us and, and either invisibilizes us or, or hyper visibilizes us. And so I started publishing around this area back in 2011. And through this work fostered a network of Chicana scholars, mother scholars interested in amplifying uh, the gendered race and class experiences of, of, our, of, our, of ourselves really. Um, and we, what began as an academic conference, uh, American Studies 2014, uh, really has come to be a robust research collective um, uh, of five committed scholars, Christine Vega, Judy, Perez, Cecilia Caballero, Yvette Martinez Gu. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about our work as a collective later, but the first project that we published um, was this anthology that Judy so kindly also mentioned. Um, it was published in 2019 by the University of Arizona Press um, as part of the inaugural series of the Feminist Wire. Um, and here we had four areas that we focused on as a way to think about um, you know, testimonials by women of color scholars, researchers, activists, allies um, who think about mothering as transformative, centering reproductive labor and the, the importance of this, of this work, um, centering an intersectional lens. Uh, and we use this concept, Chicana Mother Work, as an as a, as a idea that we uh, build from, from our experience that we hope can impact you know, others through building collectives or relations, but also informing policy. And my next project, which um, is my forthcoming book that's gonna be out this September, it's called um, Border Women in the Community of Maclovio Rojas, Autonomy in the Spaces of Neoliberal Neglect. Uh, and this has been a long engaged project that has taken me 15 years to finally publish. Um, my daughter is 15, so, if you uh, can think about how our experiences are shaped uh, and really it doesn't, it's not surprising that it took me this long, right? To, to finally get this one piece out, but it's been an engaged project where I've worked closely with the community over all of these years. Um, and this project really highlights the borderlands as a space of resistance, conviviality, agency, creative, creative community building, um, I hope that I highlight also hope and struggle and possibilities uh, in the context of gender violences along the new, uh, and racial capitalism along the US-Mexico border. And um, I'm really excited that this book I think is, is in great conversation with my colleague Mauricio Magaña's book as well. We did a really interesting talk last week with the Latin American Studies Department and ours 
Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to be a part of this group of scholars and thinkers who are, are thinking around the lines of possibilities and hope. Um, and so while the next slide, thank you. And while I value, you know, these scholarly uh, publications um, and articles, uh, I do also think about how we can democratize knowledge um, and also think about what is knowledge production, how it is defined. And I think our field really allows us to be expansive in how we define it. Um, and, and for me, it's also been a journey of trying to identify myself as a, a scholar activist, some call it uh, uh, militant, being militant in, the, you know, in how you do your research, um, research as, a, as accompaniment, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a sec. But for me, um, I also have engaged with you know, like visual ethnography, digital humanities, to tell these stories that we might tell through books and publications, but in ways that can um, be better access. So I, I gave a few examples here of some of the projects that I've done more recently. One was a documentary about the Worker Rights Center in Phoenix, Arizona, which was edited by Justine Garcia. We worked in collaboration. I also worked as a film advisor to um, a, a film called uh, singing My Way to Freedom about a Chicano musician in San Diego. Um, and then I'm currently involved in a, in a really interesting project uh, about the Mujeres de Manso, who are local heroes whose impact is really felt across the world in terms of their human rights analysis and lens and what they've offered. So thinking about how we democratize knowledge and make it more accessible, um, I also think about, we can go to the next slide, um, how to engage from the institution with community and be in community. Um, and so over the years, I've thought about different projects and, um, you know, Entre Nosotras is one project that emerged at my previous institution after I taught a course on gender in the borderlands and my students were really interested in how we can create alternatives or how we can change the social landscape and political landscape of a during a time in which our communities um, were receiving the brunt of anti-immigrant legislation, right? And so our bodies were codified, our experiences were, um, were made to be Unitarian, right? And so um, through Entre Nosotras, it was a project that I worked with students and community members, and we really tried to, through art spaces and dialogue and and the creation of, um, of events and, and possibility, we, we, we I think in those few years that we were organizing, you know, we had an impact in how, and how we talked about the, the issues faced in our communities. Beyond Boundaries is another project that I, can, I created, and I'm so sorry, but I forgot to turn on my timer. So just, I'll, I'll keep going, but just yell at me when um, I'm, I've been talking a little bit too much. Um, you can go to the next slide. And returning to this idea of community embedded projects, I think about, um, and going back to Chicana mother work and digital humanities and visual ethnography, um, one of the things that we've done really is collect, re embrace this idea of, you know, how do we share these experiences and these knowledge systems that we are writing about. Um, and so we um, developed a podcast, which through community support, we were able to crowdfund and purchase, you know, equipment. This is a picture of us at Chicana Motherwork Collective, you know, with our new equipment. We had no idea how to use it. And, and that's part of the journey, right, is, is learning together. Um, we created a, a podcast where I think now after five years, we've had, you know, 20,000 streams on iCloud and, or, you know, SoundCloud and iTunes and all these things. And, and it's really exciting because we're able to interview Ana Castillo, Chicana feminists, right? We're able to interview researchers and activists alike so that those stories can be accessed on the daily. Um, and we also, the anthology, you know, you can only publish certain chapters in a book. And so we hated turning away so many of these stories in this research. And so we decided to create a blog online and you can find us at chicanamotherwork.com where we edit blogs in, in the hopes of amplifying those experiences as well. Um, the next project that I wanted to talk about is the next slide is the Binational Arts Residency. That, that image you see was created 
um, and by you know some of our collaborators, and I and I find it really interesting because a lot of my work I think about how we can think about the border as not just a place that people pass, but as a place where we live um, and exchange and create community. Um, and so when we're thinking about how militarization and global economic policies affect us, we, we fail to think about who lives along the border, right? And so. This is a project that um, if you look at that image, it sees the borderlands as a constellation, not as a, you know, not just as a place of a, a line of demarcation. So that so the top little star is Phoenix, then it's Tucson, and then it's Nogales, and then it's Hermosillo, right? And so to think about this space as a constellation across time, across space, how do we exchange culture through this space? How do we engage with the experiences that might we might find each other? Um, all living through, um, and and over the last five years, we've we've really had some interesting conversations and and really thinking about the, these possibilities, the radical possibilities and radical hope, right, embedded in the work that we do on the ground. Um, and the last project that I wanted to talk about is Homegrown. It's here, and I'm really excited because we just received a, a, a grant, a mini grant from the Commission on Status of Women. Um, the Mothers of Color in Academia is a, a chapter that emerged originally from UCLA in California, and we've been building this chapter here in the last year. Of course, the pandemic, we were meeting, and then the pandemic moved us online, but we've been uh, meeting committedly for this entire year. Um, and I think that that space is a space that has been supportive during a time when mothers have been um, holding the space, you know, holding the families in so many ways. Um, I was reading a tweet where a publisher was talking about how there's been a dearth in, in um, proposals submitted by women in the last year. So we're gonna have in three years, we're gonna have, you know, books by men, probably all white men. Um, and we've got to think about what that, what does that mean around knowledge production? Um, and so we're uh, having a writing, writing retreat this weekend with a group of 10 uh, scholars, graduate students here on our campus um, who need some time to think and write together. And I'm really excited about that space that we're generating on campus. And if you want information about that, please, please reach out to, to us or to me and I'm happy to tell you more about it. Um, and then finally, just my last slide is Really, I've been, you know, reading the work of Gloria Saldua, Chicana feminist scholar, radically, you know, shaped how I think about my own experience. Um, and, you know, she often said, you have to do work that matters. And so for me, this has really meant how to be in this space of, you know, in the academy, I'm in it, but I'm not of it, I'm not from here. And so how do I navigate the resources in this space to support the work that I wanna do outside of this space? And so for me, that has been central to how, how, how I move. So with that, I'll, I'll end. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Great, and thank you, uh, Michelle, so much for um, telling us all about about your amazing research and advocacy and community work. Um, and uh, Damian and Ada uh, as well. It's always great to be able to share these spaces and learn more about the work that, um, that my amazing colleagues are doing uh, at uh, University of Arizona and specifically our department of Mexican American studies. I also really wanna uh, thank Judy and Monique for, um, for opening this space to us and for uh, helping us all out with the, with the logistics and making sure that everything runs smoothly. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, my research, my approach to uh, Mexican American studies um, and, and along the way, you know, kind of uh, tie it into my own biography and how, um, how my own experiences have shaped the work that I do. Um, and so I am a, um, you know, a scholar of Mexican American studies and an anthropologist. Um, and so I take a transnational and ethnographic um, approach to uh, my work in Mexican American studies. 
in order to really understand how the experiences of uh, Mexicans and Mexican Americans on both sides of the border uh, really um, offer a uh, way of um, diagnosing and critiquing and challenging um, uh, existing power relations, right? And so often this takes the shape of uh, thinking about how race and difference are produced um, in a um, transnational context. So the way that they uh, are produced and operate in the United States and how that uh, overlaps yet is distinct from how um, these um, uh, categories and identities are uh, produced in Mexico. Um, and I take particular interest in uh, what young people through their cultural expressions and their activism um, have to teach us about uh, the societies that we live in and um, the um, more liberatory and just societies that, that we might be uh, working towards if we, follow, uh, if we follow their lead and if we take their proposals uh, seriously. Um, and so my, you know, in general, those sort of research interests, um, you know, I think are very clearly the result of my own um, experience. I think that, um, you know, in certain disciplines where we're trained uh, to be a little bit more uh, reflexive and to really think more explicitly and critically about how our biographies influence our research, um, but even in, you know, um, the so-called, uh, you know, more scientific uh, disciplines, uh, that is still the case, right? All, all research that's carried out by people is influenced by those people's experiences and their biases and their, um, their expectations. Uh, and so I think uh, not acknowledging that is uh, a major um, epistemological flaw as well, as well as an ethical and methodological flaw. So I really appreciate being in a department with uh, colleagues who take very seriously, um, you know, this, this reflexivity and, and this sort of interrogation of how, um, who we are influences the work that we do. Um, in my own case, you know, my interest in uh, transnational um, migration in social movements and, um, you know, in youth activism comes from my own experience um, growing up um, in both the United States and Mexico, um, a lot of back and forth, um, you know, in, in addition to living uh, in both countries, um, also just having this experience of, you know, visiting family, uh, uh, in Mexico, even when we were uh, living up then in the United States, um, and being the son of um, a former uh, youth activist, right? My my father, uh, who you know was uh, very influential, continues to be a big influence in my life and in the way that I see the world. Um, you know, he was part of the generation that participated in the 1968 uh, student movement at the uh, UNAM, the National Autonomous University in Mexico. Um, and, um, you know, that's a really important historical reference for social movements and activism in Mexico, this 1968 uh, student movement. Um, and equally important is how this student movement was repressed by the Mexican government. Um, the Mexican military, uh, you know, opened fire on those students who were protesting um, with live ammunition and, and massacred an unknown number of, of people, um, but it's in the thousands. Um, and so, you know, I grew up having conversations with my father about politics and activism and what's possible and also what the repercussions are, right, because he experienced firsthand both those moments of, uh, you know, extreme hope and optimism, um, as well as um, brutal repression and a, a very clear take on, you know, what what governments are, are capable of doing, right, um, in order to, to maintain control and maintain the status quo. And so that very much influences the work that I do. 
the image that's up on this slide is uh, the cover of, of my recent um, book, which uh, looks specifically at um, a social movement uh, that erupted in Oaxaca, Mexico in 2006, and the role that uh, young people uh, played in that social movement, and then really looking at their political and social um, uh, projects in the 10 years following that movement to kind of get a, a, a more critical understanding of social movements and the, um, the, the legacies and impacts that social movements have um, on, on society and on individuals. Um, next slide, please. And my current research um, is uh, based on both the work that I did in Oaxaca, as well as uh, more recent um, ethnographic research in uh, Los Angeles, um, looking at um, looking at histories of uh, of activism and of multiracial community formation. Um, in black and brown neighborhoods um, that uh, have, have diverse uh, Latinx um, populations as well as diverse uh, black populations. So immigrant, non-immigrant, um, uh, indigenous, non-indigenous, um, uh, uh, multiple generations removed from migration as well as um, you know, um, black folks who, who fled uh, racial terrorism in the U.S. South uh, in the 50s and 60s, um, and so uh, looking at these um, at these communities and how they form um, lasting um, social and kinship um, networks and and projects um, as a way of really rethinking. Uh, how we understand race uh, in, in this country, right? Often race is framed really in a black white sort of narrative or as a uh, zero sum game where um, non-white communities are pitted against each other um, in order to um, you know, fight over scarce resources, right? Sort of fight over crumbs. And so the work that I do um, with this current research is really countering those tropes and those um, and those those stories, and really looking at how uh, Black and Brown folks um, build together and um, form um, relationships and communities together. And so I do that looking at these activist histories, but then also by uh, looking at youth cultural production, specifically through um, murals and hip hop, um, as an alternative sort of archive of where these stories are told, right? So both thinking about what we can learn by uh, understanding social movements, but also what can we learn by reading the cultural productions that young people produce? Um, what are they telling us about how they understand history and how they understand community and how they understand identity, politics and things um, of that nature. And so it's, you know, it's very much an interdisciplinary um, um, you know, project um, that, that pulls heavily on ethnography, but also cultural analysis, um, and also tries to understand the experience of Mexicans and Mexican Americans in the United States, not in isolation, but in relation to other communities that, saw, that um, experience similar um, forms of, uh, of oppression, but also similar forms of expression and of joy. Um, and how they're different, right? So understanding critically how race and difference are produced relationally, not in isolation or not um, primarily in relationship to whiteness, which is often the way that, um, you know, uh, ethnic studies scholarship was done in the past. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I, I already talked a little bit about the work that this, um, this slide um, gestures to um, and so I think in the interest of time, um, I'll leave it there, but if anybody has specific questions about what Nipsey Mural, uh, Nipsey Hustle uh, has to do with, you know, this project, so I'd be happy to answer those questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. I have uh, many questions I've written down. 
Um, and I wish that we had much more time. I say this every time, maybe next year we need to make these an hour and a half. Um, I'm sure that folks have questions. You can um, pop them in the chat. Um, and Anna, I know Anna, Dr. Anna O'Leary has asked a question. Would you like us to invite you to unmute? We'll unmute you, Anna, and, and if you'd like, you can ask your question or I can read it. Uh, uh, so can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, I, I did put in the chat, but I was thinking, and thanks everybody for such a great, such great presentation. I'm just like, so happy, so happy just to hear your voices and to hear about your work. But I was, I was thinking in terms of what everybody's work is doing, engaging with communities, our local communities and also international communities. And I was wondering, uh, you know, we live in a very crazy time right now. And I was wondering if this has impacted uh, your work and your outreach and your service to those communities. Or do you have tips? Do you have secrets that you could, that we could all, you know, live by and you know, to help us in our work? Uh, and most importantly, you know, how do we get more students, uh, you know, into our a program such as ours, it doesn't have to be I mean, just ours, but, you know, where they are exposed to all these insights uh, about knowledge and the use of knowledge to empower and to lift, uh, you know, communities that are, you know, pretty much battered uh, by our political climate. So I know that's a, that's a mouthful, but I'll just let uh, you 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 figure out how, how you want to answer that. So I, I think everybody brings something into the picture. So so thanks again, and I'll just uh, I'll I'll listen to what your your answers are. Thank you. I guess I can go first since I unmuted. <laughs> um, I think um, it has uh, impacted our our community engagement. But what we have done is we have uh, found different approaches to engaging with the community, whether that's a meeting by Zoom whether it's um, meeting one-on-one -on, -one on the phone uh, with people. Um, the need has grown in our community. And so it's always trying to find ways to um, meet the needs of the community. But I've also found that because we are in this kind of isolation phase, I've been able to engage more. So with the community with, um, you know, uh, kids in, that are in middle school and high school because I've been invited to share my work with families. And I think that that's a great way to um, expose, you know, kids in different uh, ages about the educational pathway to higher education. So by them seeing someone who might look like them, who, who comes from the border, who comes, who's a first generation college student, who speaks candidly with them about you know, I talked to them about when I got to the U of A, how I didn't even know what a syllabus was. And when they kept talking about that, I kept saying like, that wasn't on the list of the books to buy at the bookstore, right? And how I've progressed from that to, you know, being a faculty member at the university. So I think it's provided us with opportunities to speak and have a, a greater reach um, because of the platform. And I think moving forward, at least in my work, we're gonna to have to be cognizant of that and incorporate these multiple platforms so that we can be more inclusive as we move forward with our research and even with our teaching agenda and our outreach to um, students, because that's the goal, right? Is to get more and more students, Latinx students and other students into the educational pipeline. Thank you for that, Ada. I'm just gonna say two quick things because I don't have the answer, but. I do think it's important to, as we look at closures, you know, all these closures that are happening, what are the apertures? What, where are the possibilities and where we can focus our energies on those openings? And, and I do think that, you know, everything that Ada just says, you know, rings true. And, you know, recognizing that behind the institution, we're, we're all humans trying to relate to one another. And so how do we humanize this experience so that, you know, and then we don't hold the line on, the, on, an, on an institution that wasn't created for us. I, I really love the, the, the answers um, and I'll, I'll build on, on what we've just heard uh, regarding, you know, humanizing 
uh, for students and and making um, visible and even I would say de you know demystifying the the power structures that we've all been born into, including the the academic ones. And so for, for me as a as a first year college student, um, Ava's comment reminded me of this. But I for the first time uh, ending up in a classroom, I heard a professor refer to the required textbooks not by the titles of those books, but by the the authors or editors of those books. So I had the, the requirements right in front of me. I had them there, I'd purchased them correctly. But, but the professor is referring to something that I didn't make the connection. And so I, my, my assumption was already I have failed because I don't have the right, the, the correct texts. And so I think, you know, working to demystify um, the power structures that, that students are attempting to enter, right? Um, and breaking them down, making them visible um, I think is is that those steps alone can make um, a very a very a big difference as we are forging community, creating community, creating support. Even even if we're not receiving the support ourselves or the support that we want to receive, and students are not receiving the kind of support from larger, um, you know, polit the political era that we find ourselves in or this part of the country um, to create that support ourselves to make it happen. And we have about a minute left. Um, one question that popped up was how do we access your books? So what we'll do is go back through um, the slides and pull out all the books that you all mentioned, the publisher sites, but if you want to send any information to us, we'll put that in one sheet and then we'll put it up on our HSI initiatives website along with the um, recording so that people can access it and people can buy your books um, because we want them to have access to these incredible resources. Um, but in the last minute, I mean, and you all have touched on this throughout the presentations and especially in this, re the responses to um, the question, but what else is needed, right, to build institutional capacity around our HSI work, um, the, the humanizing aspects of it, the demystifying pieces, um, but is there anything else that you want to make sure to end with so that we are holding ourselves responsible as the institution. Oh, I was just going to say that um, you know I think a lot of times we make it more complicated than it than it really needs to be. I think the uh, the research by folks you know such as uh, Gina Garcia that she started off quoting um, and work that we all do uh, at the University of Arizona and the work that's done through HSI um, initiatives. Um, you know we know what needs to be done. Um, there needs to be uh, resources allocated and power given to folks who can carry out um, that work, right? And so it's, it, you know, recognizing is, is great, but it, then the follow through, that's, you know, that's, that's when the, you know, um, that's when it really comes down to it, you know? So with that, we end our amazing series for the year, which has turned out to be so much more than I could have ever imagined. Um, it's been a gift for me personally to connect with people across the institution and hold space together. Um, and I hope that it's also been a platform um, to really highlight the, the research, the practice, the programs, um, the space that everybody who has been part of these webinars um, have created and have always created. I mean, that to me is, is, is a key piece of this is, um, you all have always been in, engaged in this work and we want to continue to highlight the work that you're doing and support it and, and offer those resources. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you for being part of today, for your commitment um, and certainly for your time and energy. Thank you to everybody who has joined us. Um, I know there are people on this call who have been to every single one. I wish I had like gold stars or stickers to give out. Um, we appreciate you and I, huge thank you to Monique Beltran who has coordinated the entire series um, and has helped us to do this rather seamlessly. So thank you, Monique, for everything. Um, I wish you all the best as we rack up, wrap up this academic year and I cannot wait to see people hopefully in person in the next few months. Thanks everyone.